these are the types of gastric tumors benign as well as malignant now regarding the uh, uh, benign tumor these are the names epithelial one okay connective tissue tumor vascular tumor and smooth muscle tumor so epithelial are the adenoma they may be polyp or they may be polyposis polyp is a single one a polyposis is the multiple one they are known as gastric adenoma adenoma means they are benign connective tissue may be fibroma or neurofibroma both are benign vascular they are hemangioma they can occur anywhere where there are blood vessels and leiomyoma uh, stomach has a smooth muscle coat so leiomyoma also can be there so these are the benign one they are very uncommon and they are reported in about 5 to 25 percent of the autopsies and they do not cause much clinical problem so they are not important from you know discussion point of view let's move on on the other hand the second types of gastric tumor are malignant see there they are again divided into primary and secondary primary means the malignant tumor develop right there in the stomach and secondary means it has reached the stomach from some other sources the most common primary you know gastric malignancy is adenocarcinoma see that in 95% of the time adenocarcinoma is the primary gastric malignancy others may be lymphoma leiomyosarcoma or carcinoid i'm sure by this time every student know the meaning of these lymphoma is the malignancy which is developed from lymphoid tissue leiomyosarcoma is the malignant counterpart of leiomyoma leiomyoma is a benign tumor developed from smooth muscle so if malignant tumor comes from the smooth muscle we call it leiomyosarcoma and what is carcinoid by the way what is this it is Exactly, serotonin releasing malignancy. Serotonin releasing malignancy or tumor. Excellent. Now, secondary, there is quite uncommon uh, in in case of stomach, but the sources okay include spread from a breast carcinoma or malignant melanoma, or spread from adjacent intestinal organ, okay, like pancreas. Or even from the nearby structure, which is very uncommon, so we never talked about this. Now, with this, a basic you know information regarding the classification. Let's enter into the topic of gastric carcinoma, or also known as carcinoma of the stomach. This is a malignant tumor arising from the stomach, and this is very common and fatal tumor. Very common as well as fatal one. why it is fatal because the early diagnosis is a challenge it's a difficult thing and by the time we diagnose carcinoma of the stomach probably the patient is already in stage 3 or stage 4 unfortunately the late presentation of many cases is the cause of poor overall survival figure in case of carcinoma of the stomach it is difficult to diagnose early now why you may ask that question and the reason is many clinical features almost looks like peptic ulcer disease and peptic ulcer disease you know many people think oh i just go to the medic so medicinal shop and then ask for some antipeptic drug and the shopkeeper can easily prescribe those drug or give those drug to them they don't want to go to the doctor they think this is a very minor problem but actually okay or some of them may be having carcinoma of the stomach which is showing the features like peptic ulcer disease so this is why the disease is diagnosed late the only treatment modality able to cure the disease is resectional surgery okay we'll talk about that at the end when we talk the management part now let's talk about the epidemiology of carcinoma of the stomach stomach cancer is the fourth most common cancer worldwide but i don't want to give a lot of uh, emphasis or importance here because this data can change okay according to the year from which uh, the data is taken 
and you know according to the different type of study but one important point you need to remember it is one of the commonest cancer okay it is a disease with a high death rate or high fatality rate because of the late presentation it is more common in men than in women and it is much more common in korea japan china uk south america and iceland more than other countries but uh, i also like uh, do not want to give a lot of emphasis here uh, if uh, you know we don't uh, properly explain then the medical student may think this disease is only found in those country please it is not the point here it is more commonly found in those country but it may be found everywhere in the world even in south asian countries this disease is quite common these days now what is the etiology etiology means what are the causes these are the predisposing factor for carcinoma of the stomach regarding the general predisposing factor it is more common in male sex and lower socio economic groups okay and it increases uh, when the person is relatively older like 50 to 70 years so more common in lower socio economic group and relatively older patient genetic factors play a role here okay like just like any other malignancy or cancer genetic factors play the role though there is a relatively weak influence of the genetic factor but these are the points which will pinpoint the role of genetic factors here see this it is more common in individuals of blood group a but this is a bit of controversial statement but from the exam point of view the question can be asked to you blood group a has some type of association with gastric carcinoma and blood group o has certain association with duodenal ulcer so remember these two points from the blood group side blood group a association with gastric cancer blood group o has association with duodenal ulcer there is positive family history in four portion of the cases and there is an increase incidence in certain ethnic and racial group like japanese okay black population and american indians and that uh, clearly tells us probably there is a certain role of genes there otherwise uh, the question can be asked why it is not common in all type of races because the genes may be present only in the certain type of ethnic population now what is the role of diet okay the diet has got a very important role to play nitrites which are derived from nitrate are the important carcinogen regarding carcinoma of the stomach okay nitrites that derive from nitrate and they are very common in preserved type of food now preserved food let's talk about the meat here okay sausage isn't it salami and all those you know a preserved type of uh, meat or preserved type of food even tuna fish all those different type of things are high in case of nitrite concentration so we should, we cannot take this food almost every day you know one or two time in a week or in a month yes everybody wants to have this type of food we want to change the taste that is fine but not in a regular basis a smoked and salted food and pickled vegetables are also you know uh, damaging for the stomach lining okay remember the barbecued food which is so popular in china japan and korea now these days it is popular everywhere of course even we love to eat that almost in a regular basis but these foods are not good for our health they are smoked food and they are excessively salted one once or twice we can have them but not on a regular basis lack of fruit and vegetables this is common you know a type of things in any malignancy what what is the link between fresh fruit and vegetable and malignancy what is the link yes so fresh fruits and vegetables uh, contain the vitamins uh, like vitamins a and different which are the antioxidant and maintain the epithelial covering and uh, uh, Yes. Exactly. 
exactly he's absolutely right these fresh fruit and vegetables contain antioxidants just remember that they contain antioxidant so let me write here so that you don't forget it antioxidants like different type of vitamins vitamin a vitamin c vitamin e even vitamin d is considered so important these days okay regarding this epithelial health so these antioxidants are absolutely necessary for us to 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 neutralize the oxidizing radical or oxidizing agent which are damaging the dna of our cell and in other word they they cause mutation so these antioxidants prevents from the mutation happening lack of animal fat and protein and lack of vitamin c and e we already talked uh, you can you can talk about this in this lack of fresh fruit and vegetables all of these are important factor in the causation of stomach cancer now certain other uh, factors would be the host factor disease that produce hypochlorhydria or achlorhydria state associated with an increased risk now hypochlorhydria is decreased amount of hcl and achlorhydria no hcl production it is strongly associated with increased chance of gastric cancer later on these hypochlorhydria and achlorhydria they encourage bacterial colonization because hydrochloric acid is one of the important substance which is present in our stomach okay and it's antibacterial in nature okay it is one of the uh, first line defense of our body it can kill the bacteria there and it will also you know uh, not allow the conversion of dietary nitrate and nitrite into the nitrosamine if if there is hydrochloric acid okay it will not allow this thing to happen in case of decrease hydrochloric acid or you know a decrease or no hydrochloric acid okay all these things are happening now what are the condition where there is hypochlorhydria or achlorhydria one of that is pernicious anemia now pernicious anemia i'm sure 100% of the student know that uh, know this point that's why i'm not asking pernicious anemia is the problem of parietal cell okay this is a type of autoimmune disease where parietal cells of the stomach are attacked by our own immune system so in this case there is presence of anti parietal cell antibody remember this and uh, uh, this uh, parietal cell has got two function one at cell production and another is intrinsic factor formation intrinsic factor is very much essential for the absorption of vitamin b12 as a result of that it will lead to megaloblastic anemia okay so one of the cause of megaloblastic anemia is pernicious anemia always remember like that at the same time because of decreased hydrochloric acid synthesis there is hypochlorhydria or achlorhydria another condition is chronic gastritis okay chronic gastritis there are different types of chronic gastritis type a and type b both of uh, are associated with hypochlorhydria another is menetrier's disease okay there is decreased amount of hydrochloric acid secretion menetrier's disease uh, just just uh, can you tell me what is menetrier's disease yes anybody sir, sir, may I, sir, sir, may I, sir yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, Mm. Overgrowth. Massive uh, overgrowth of mucus cells. Mm -hmm. Sir, may I explain? Sir, mm -hmm. sir, sir menetrier disease. Sir, it is a sir, it is a uh, acquired and sir, it is a pre-malignant disease of stomach. Sir, in which sir, there like sir, uh, massive gastric fold. And sir, because of the foveolar hyperplasia in there. And sir, sir, there is high mucus production. Sir, uh, sir, also causing protein loss. And sir, there is less at uh, and um, and almost less or no acid production. And sir, plus uh, it is uh, it is highly associated with the gro uh, the TGF alpha secretion as well, sir. Exactly. So he has uh, given a very detailed you know explanation. of menetrier's disease okay uh, all of those are correct uh, explanation very good but remember whenever your teacher asks you know you can simply say this is a hyperplasia or hypertrophy of the gastric fold or rugosities in case of menetrier's disease those rugosities or rugal fold are massive in size so it is associated with hypochlorhydria one excessive mucus or mucin production two 
and a lot of proteins also can be lost from that area. So it is one of the cause of protein losing enteropathy as well. And over a long period of time, it is associated with carcinoma of the stomach, menetrius disease. Uh, towards the end of this uh, big topic, you know, I will talk a little bit about menetrius disease as well. Helicobacter pylori, very important cause. Remember, this bacteria is the most important cause of peptic ulcer disease these days, both gastric ulcer as well as duodenal ulcer is caused by H. pylori. But even gastric cancer is caused by H. pylori. So important question from the examination point of view. Partial gastrectomy, the risk of malignancy in the residual stump is increased two to six fold. Multiple factors are associated here. Probably the reflux of the bile is one of the important factor. Another one is again hypochlorhydria or achlorhydria. Now, let's continue about the, some other host factors. Presence of gastric neoplastic polyp, okay, is associated with gastric cancer. This neoplastic polyp can just convert into gastric cancer. Gastric ulcers, already talked so many times, okay, few of the gastric ulcer may convert into gastric cancer, especially uh, if the ulcer is more than two centimeter, okay, and towards the greater curvature side. Intestinal metaplasia and dysplasia. Intestinal metaplasia and dysplasia. Okay. These are also associated with uh, gastric cancer. What is the meaning of this? See there, this is not the occurring in intestine. The meaning is gastric epithelium is you know, changing into the intestinal looking epithelium. That is the meaning, okay? So, uh, intestinal epithelium uh, or epithelial cells are quite tall, okay? They're quite tall type of epithelial cells, columnar type of epithelium. So metaplasia and dysplasia, high chance. Smoking, high chance. And occupational, like exposure to asbestos and coal dust can also predispose to the development of gastric malignancy. Now, uh, let's focus on this slide here. All of you, please uh, look here properly. A helicobacter pylori, see there? And diet, which is low in vitamin C, vitamin E, or the person is taking high salted diet, okay? Or a smoked type of diet, isn't it? Or a preserved type of food most of the time. So what is happening here because of this exposure? the normal gastric mucosa will develop chronic superficial gastritis. It may convert into atrophic type of gastritis. Then intestinal metaplasia can occur, which can result in dysplasia and then ultimately to the cancer. So first is inflammation. Inflammation can lead to metaplasia, dysplasia, then cancer. So this is the pathogenesis which we already discussed in so many other types of malignancy as well. Now, what are the site of gastric cancer? Okay. If we uh, look carefully inside the stomach, where the gastric cancer is commonly occurring. Carcinoma of the distal stomach and body of the stomach is the most common in low socioeconomic group. Okay. So uh, let's highlight the important points here. Distal stomach and body of the stomach. So this is one of the common site. Generally, antrum near the lesser curvature, almost 40% of the time. Body and fundus, almost 30% of the time. Cardiac end, around 25%. And throughout the whole stomach, around 5%. There is one a condition known as linitis plastica, or leather bottle stomach. It, it can involve the whole stomach there. Okay. So these are the uh, you know, common area where carcinoma of the stomach can occur. See this, the most common site is antral area. Now, I want to associate uh, this uh, condition with gastric outlet obstruction, which we have just discussed. If a big mass is present in the antral area, 
then it can easily lead to obstruction there. That is known as gastric outlet obstruction. Gastric cancer occurring after pernicious anemia occurs usually in fundic area. Okay, now, if uh, whereas the increase in proximal gastric cancer seems to affect principally the higher socioeconomic group, we really do not know what is the mechanism involved here. Okay, this is the result of some extensive researches, but uh, uh, not a very, very important question uh, your teacher will ask you. They can simply ask where in the stomach are the common site for gastric cancer. Okay, uh, they, they do not uh, especially focus on the low socioeconomic group or higher socioeconomic group. So uh, just, uh, you know, revise once again. See here, this, uh, this is the schematic diagram of the stomach. So it, it can occur in the antral area, uh, even near to the pyloric area, in the body, okay, in the cardiac end, and things like that. Now, what are the types of gastric cancer? Let's classify it. The classification is based on macroscopic growth pattern, depth of the invasion and according to the histology macroscopic means when we see it you know with our naked eye uh, for example the surgeon is doing endoscopy what he can see with the help of that endoscope that is known as macroscopic appearance or gross appearance you can say and it is because of the depth of invasion and third is a histological type now, based on macroscopic growth pattern, these are the different types. See there, macroscopically, it shows three growth pattern. What are those? Three growth pattern. First is exophytic, also known as fungating, or cauliflower pattern of the growth. Exophytic means from the surface, okay, from the mucosal surface, it is protruding towards the lumen. This is known as fungating, exophytic, or cauliflower growth. So see here, the tumor mass protrudes into the lumen. It is a polypoid type of growth, and it has got a better prognosis than the other morphological type, probably because of the earlier diagnosis. You know, when the size of the stomach is substantially decreased, then the person will have early satiety. Okay, a bit of vomiting and those type of clinical features are even have hematopoiesis and melina. So disease can be earlier diagnosed. That's why the prognosis will be better. That's the only reason. The second is a flat, which is also known as infiltrating type of carcinoma. So they spread widely beneath the mucosa and invade the muscular layer. Okay, and we use the term Linitis plastica for this because it resembles leather bottle type of stomach. Now, what is the meaning of leather bottle? You all know the meaning. You know that leather bottle uh, doesn't have much stretching capacity. It, it cannot stretch that much. The same type of concept here. The walls of the stomach are infiltrated by the malignant shell. Okay, so it becomes a rather stiff. Okay, and it will lose its elasticity. This is known as linitis plastica or leather bottle stomach. The third one is excavated or ulcerative type. See this excavated or ulcerative type. Now, the name itself suggests there is ulcer formation here. These ulcers are broad based ulcer with a necrotic center, okay? They are usually large in size, much larger than gastric ulcer. Remember, sometimes we are confused where this is a peptic type of gastric ulcer or this is gastric cancer. So size is really important one. Usually the gastric ulcers are less than two centimeters, whereas gastric uh, cancers ulcers are much more larger than that. There are so many other uh, important differences. We'll talk about them a bit later. The edge of the tumor is hip top, means overhanging margin, hip top, because of the rapid growth, you know, the edge is going up from the surface and the margin are irregular. These are the, some of the important differences 
between benign type of gastric ulcer and malignant type of gastric ulcer. And uh, they are uh, quite nicely differentiated with the help of endoscopic exam. Now, this picture you have already seen in pathology discussion. Now, all of you, uh, please uh, focus here and take a bit of time. This is an exophytic growth. What is exophytic growth once again? What is this? Yes, see that? It's produced to the lumen, and to the lumen. Exactly. For a fume from the surface. Exactly. Now see this? Very good. All of you are correct. See this? This is a mucosa. Okay. Here is mucosa. Uh, this is the lumen. Here is the, this side is the lumen of the stomach. This is submucosa. And here is the muscle layer. So if the tumor is protruding into the lumen, we call it exophytic polypoid or cauliflower like growth. Now, the second one is excavated. Let's see this, it is going deeper. It is going deeper. It is going to form the ulcer. And regarding the definition of ulcer, uh, uh, I will ask you one simple question here. What are the three parts of the mucosa? What are the three parts of the mucosa? Yes. What are the three layers of the mucosa? Who can answer this? This is the histology question. Three layers of the mucosa. Anybody? Uh, sir, the, um, sir, the sir, most clear is the mucosa, sir. The lamina propria, sir. And the epithelium is the most clear, sir. Yes. Muscularis mucosa. Uh, sir, muscularis yeah. mucosa, sir. Um, sir, the lamina propria, sir. And we've got the epithelium, the innermost layer. Exactly. You're absolutely right. Yes. That's the question I'm asking. Epithelium. Okay. Then uh, lamina propria, lamina propria, and muscularis mucosa. And muscularis mucosa. Now, there is a reason why I have brought this point here. If this ulcer has crossed the muscularis mucosa layer, then this is no more erosion. It is definite ulcer. This is, you never forget this because there are some erosion formed inside the stomach. And sometimes it's difficult for us uh, to distinguish whether it is a real ulcer or just the erosion. Erosions are easier to treat, but ulcers are very difficult. So definition of ulcer is when this extension is already crossing the muscular mucosa and even beyond than that, it is definite ulcer. So excavated means ulcer formation. These are the three layers of the mucosa, okay? Sorry. You can write it here. These are the three layers of the mucosa so that you don't forget later. Now, uh, the another one is a flat or depressed type flat or depressed type, slightly depressed, but not, uh, you know, like ulcer formed. Look at this is not even going, uh, you know, from the uh, mucosa site. It is not even going to the uh, submucosal area, okay? And another important type is a uh, linitis plastica, when this flat or depressed type is involving the whole of the thickness of the stomach, it will lead to loss of elasticity of the stomach. That's why we also call it leather bottle type of stomach. Very important question from examination point of view. Now, all of you, please focus here. Look at this big ulcer here. This is ulcer. This is a necrotic base, okay? Necrotic tissue, slough we call it. And look at the edge of the ulcer, it is overhanging edge. Okay, overhanging is, it is quite irregular. Okay, it is like beaded in appearance. Okay, and uh, this is big in size. So all these are important points uh, for the malignant type of ulcer. This is excellent picture here. Let's move on. Another type is based on the depth of invasion. 
based on the depth of invasion. Now, this is a malignant tumor we are talking about. So it has a property of local invasion. It can go deeper and deeper. So according to that, uh, we divide into early gastric carcinoma and late gastric carcinoma. So carcinoma, which is confined to the mucosa and submucosa, irrespective of the lymph node involvement are the early gastric cancer. They may be exophytic, they may be flat, or they may be ulcerative, but they should not cross the submucosa area. They should not uh, you know, uh, reach to the muscle layer. That is the early one. Late gastric carcinoma extended below the mucosa up to the muscle layer. And they may be exophytic, flat, or ulcerative, just like before. And if infiltration occurs throughout the stomach, it is known as lineitis plastica. Lineitis plastica is always a late type of gastric cancer because it is extensively uh, you know, infiltrated. Now, okay, the, the picture, it's a schematic diagram, but very, very informative one. And uh, if you remember, uh, I showed this picture during the pathology discussion also. This is the early gastric cancer. Uh, see this exophytic type, flat or depressed type, or ulcerative type, but they have uh, are not uh, reached to the muscle layer. They have not reached to the muscle layer. Either mucosa or submucosa is affected. That's why they are the earlier one. Whereas the late gastric cancer, look at this. It has involved the muscle already. See this? Muscle. Okay, is extensive involvement, lineitis plastic or leather bottle type. And this also is so deep that it has already involved the muscle layer. So these are late gastric carcinoma. Now, this is a beautiful specimen. This is a specimen, you know, uh, which is showing leather bottle stomach or lineitis plastica. Look at the thickness of the stomach wall. This thickness okay is because of the infiltration of the stomach wall because of the malignant cells okay now see there the lumen the lumen is quite narrow and it is non distensible as a result of this this person will have early satiety early satiety even after after eating a less or a small amount of food uh, okay or the meal the person is full okay and the family member will ask the question, what's wrong with you? Why are you not eating, uh, you know, just like before? And the person says, I cannot eat. I'm full already. At the same time, the person must be losing weight, you know. The person has so many other features of malignancy, but people may not see it properly. The person may ignore it. And uh, it, it may uh, cause delay in the medical attention. Now, another type of classification is based on the histology. This is also known as Lorentz classification. So there are different types of histological you know, uh, classification now. Uh, in the system, there are principally two forms of the gastric cancer. One is intestinal gastric cancer, where intestinal metaplasia is essential, means the gastric epithelium is you know, changing into the intestinal type of epithelium. This is known as intestinal metaplasia. And another is diffuse gastric cancer. Okay. And in this type, the cancer cells are arranged uh, singly or in cluster. Okay. Even the signet cell may appear. I'll show you what the signet cell means okay, in, the, in the picture. Signet cell uh, uh, is the nucleus okay, is uh, present towards the peripheral area. The nucleus is pushed towards one of the peripheral sites, and a lot of mucin is collected inside the cell. So it all almost looks like a ring, okay, ring on the finger, and we call it signet cell appearance. This diffuse gastric cancer is spread widely in the gastric wall and hence has a much worse prognosis. Now, all of you, please focus here. Uh, this is the intestinal type because the gastric epithelium is changing the intestinal type. Okay, it looks like a intestinal glands. 
just like look like a cancer of colon and esophagus. Whereas this is a diffuse type of carcinoma and look at this uh, signet ring cell. See this? This is a nucleus. The nucleus is pushed to the periphery. Okay. And uh, there is a lot of mucin collection in the cytoplasm. So if I, uh, you know, compare this appearance, it almost looks like a ring-like appearance. This is a ring on the, you know, surface of the finger. Just remember this, this area looks like finger and this area looks like the ring. This is known as signet ring appearance. Okay, so these are uh, uh, two important histological type, intestinal type and a diffuse type of gastric cancer. Now, let's talk about how a gastric cancer is spread. Okay, what are the different modalities of spread? First is a direct spread to the surrounding area or the surrounding structure. Now look at this picture here. The surrounding uh, structures, the important ones are lower end of the esophagus and the pancreas. Pancreas is present right there in the stomach bed. Okay, the spleen is also present a little bit, you know, uh, on the left side. See this spleen, and the upper part is the esophagus. Liver is also present here. Okay, the porta hepatis is present here. The lesser omentum is present here. The greater omentum is here. So, uh, if these structures or the organs are involved by the direct spread, okay, we call that local invasion. Local invasion, that is the modality of spread here, also known as direct spread. The second one is a lymphatic spread. Lymphatic spread. Now, Metastasis to the regional lymph node is quite common, and sometimes the metastasis can occur quite distant lymph node as well, like left supraclavicular lymph node in large bed, and we call this troisius sign. Now, this is a beautiful diagram which is showing this. See that, uh, you know, there is a probably the source of the malignancy of the cancer cell. It will first go to the cisterna chile. This is the you know initiation at the beginning of thoracic duct. Okay, then through the thoracic duct, the malignant cells will go upward, and then it may involve the left supraclavicular lymph node. Okay, and this is known as troisius sign. Okay, but the name of this lymph node is known as Virchow's lymph node. Name of the lymph node is Virchow's lymph node, but this particular sign is known as troisius sign. Later on also, we'll, I will talk about this. Now, a little bit more knowledge here. There are different uh, tiers of the lymph node, okay, uh, around the stomach. Some of the lymph nodes are attached right on the side of the greater omentum, sorry, greater curvature, as well as lesser curvature. These are known as first tier of the lymph node, or D1, okay, first tier of the lymph node, or D1 is the first tier. The second tier or D2 of the lymph node are present according to the origin of the blood vessels like celiac trunk origin, hepatic artery origin, left gastric artery origin, and splenic artery origin. So the lymph nodes are also present there. That is called second tier of the lymph node. The third tier of the lymph node are present, okay, near the hepatoduodenal ligament. Hepatoduodenal ligament, you know, means, let me go back to the, you know, previous picture. See this, this is known as hepatoduodenal ligament or lesser omentum, age of the lesser omentum. The lymph nodes which are, you know, involved in this area or even the root of the mesentery. Okay, these are the third tier of the lymph node. And the fourth tier are the paraaortic lymph node, okay, and paracolic lymph node. Now, why I am uh, bringing this point here? This is so important regarding the management. Along with, uh, you know, removal of the stomach, the surgeon needs to remove this lymph node as well. Depends on which tier of the lymph nodes are affected. 
they always remove the first tier. There is no doubt about it. Even the second tier lymph node, they regularly remove. But what about the third and fourth tier? Okay, they cannot be removed so easily. And if they are affected, the disease is al already very advanced. Okay, so this is the concept about different lymph node tiers related to the stomach. I'll repeat this again during the management discussion. Now, the third type of spread of gastric cancer is a blood burn, okay, or hematogenous metastasis. Now, stomach is drained by portal vein. So, blood burn metastasis occur first to the liver through the portal vein, and from there, subsequently to the other organ, including lungs and the bone. But liver is the most important organ from the hematogenous metastasis site. They are uncommon in the absence of nodal disease. Nodal metastasis always occurs first. Remember from the pathological discussion, epithelial malignancy usually metastasize earlier, okay, from lymphatic way or the nodal metastasis, whereas sarcoma, which are malignancy of connective tissue, they I usually metastasize earlier from the hematogenous way. Epithelial cancer, lymphatic metastasis, and sarcoma from the hematogenous one earlier, okay? But later on, yes, even epithelial one can metastasize through the blood. Let's move on. Now, the fourth one is a transperitoneal spread. This is also a very important concept here, transperitoneal spread. This is a common mode of spread once the tumor has reached the serosa of the stomach and it indicates incurability, means the, the cancer has already crossed that limit of cure. Only palliative treatment can be provided in this situation. Tumors can manifest anywhere in the peritoneal cavity and give rise to ascites, okay? if the cancer cells infiltrate the peritoneal membrane or peritoneum, ascites is quite common. Krukenberg tumor, if they are deposited on the ovarian surface. Remember, in this case, bilateral ovaries are affected and this tumor can become really huge one. These are called Krukenberg tumor. Very, very important question from the exam point of view. And if they are you know, deposited in the umbilical area, we call that Sister Mary Joseph's nodule or simply Sister Joseph nodule. Sister Mary Joseph nodule or Sister Joseph's nodule. So these are uh, transperitoneal spread. All of these are important MCQ questions. Advanced peritoneal disease may be palpated either abdominally or rectally as a tumor self. Okay, or rectally as a tumor cell. During the per rectal examination or digital examination of the rectum, sometimes the tumor can be felt there as a tumor cell in case of transparent spread. And it can be detected most effectively by laparoscopy and cytology. Now, cytology, for example, if ascites is there, you aspirate the ascitic fluid and then send to the lab. Sometimes they may detect the malignant cells there. It's the cytological exam. Laparoscopy, every student knows. This is a special instrument known as laparoscope, which is inserted inside the peritoneal cavity, and it is a direct observation, and even a biopsy can be taken. So what are the four, four uh, you know, way of uh, gastric uh, carcinoma spread? The first one is direct invasion also known as local invasion. Second is a lymphatic one, okay? Lymphatic one. Third is a hematogenous one. And the last one is a transparent spread. Now look at this picture here. So this is stomach, okay? For example, here is a malignancy. This malignancy can go to the nearby area. This is a direct uh, type of spread. It can involve the lymph node. This is a lymphatic spread. 
it can go uh, to the blood hematogenous spread and then it can involve the peritoneum and through the peritoneum it can go towards the ovary this is known as Krukenberg tumor it can involve the peritoneum and called ascites it can go to the umbilicus okay which is known as sister joseph's nodule or sister mary joseph's nodule now look at this abdomen what 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 observation okay is there in this abdomen yes what can you see in the abdomen distended um, distended abdomen ascites exactly you should say the abdomen is distended okay that is the correct way of answering and then according to the topic which we are talking now this is the carcinoma of the stomach it can metastasize to the peritoneum and peritoneal affection can lead to ascites so most probably this is a case of ascites always say like that in the exam always otherwise the, the examiner thinks you know you have already seen this case you have already seen this picture somebody was already helping you so you know be be a little bit clever in in answering the question yes you, you already know this is ascites but start like this this case is abdominal distension and looking at the stretching of the abdominal skin okay looking at the clue which i was provided that is stomach cancer most probably this abdominal distension is caused by ascites okay that is a perfect answer and this is uh, the sister joseph's nodule now with all this discussion let's move on to the important part of this lecture what are the clinical features of carcinoma of the stomach you you have got a good concept now so this part of the lecture is very easy we have roughly divided them into different heading general features local feature metastatic feature and paraneoplastic syndrome so let's talk one after other the common general features okay in case of carcinoma of the stomach these are general features regarding the clinical feature okay are anorexia anorexia means loss of appetite anemia okay. asthenia is extreme weakness asthenia is weakness loss of weight these all are very common feature these are present in any type of malignancy not only here that's why these are known as general or non specific feature but they may they may provide us the us a clue you know we, if 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 some patient is having these features we may suspect malignancy now it is our job to find where is that malignancy where in the body is it in the gi tract is it inside the lung is it in the urinary bladder or the kidney something like that so these are called general features loss of weight in case of malignancy is because of the metabolic effects of the tumor and a reduced intake of food these these cause extreme loss of weight this is extreme loss of weight and can you tell me the medical term of extreme loss of weight what we call that yes what is the term we use significant weight loss significant weight loss if that weight loss is so cachexia. significant cachexia. very good this is known as cachexia cachexia is extreme loss of the weight so gastric cancer or just like any other cancer is one of the cause of cachexia but this is direct effect of the tumor because it is a rapidly growing mass and it will utilize all the nutrients whichever the patient is taking or eating at the same time it is causing anorexia patient is not uh, taking a lot of food and the third one especially in this case if this uh, tumor is causing gastric outlet obstruction it can lead to repeated vomiting okay and all the effect of that gastric outlet obstruction can also lead to severe malnutrition now let's talk about the local feature local features means because of that mass because of the cancer there what are the local clinical manifestation patients are most commonly over 50 years of age and initially develop dyspepsia now see here that's why many of the people confuse this with peptic ulcer disease or even gastritis because of this dyspeptic symptom dyspepsia means a very vague type of symptom the patient may have certain uneasiness 
on their tummy. They may have certain gas formation on their belly, or uh, you know they may complain about indigestion. This is known as dyspepsia. With advanced disease, patient present as early satiety, bloating, and distension. Now see this early satiety means okay, after eating a small volume or amount of the food, patient feels satisfied. This is because of decreased capacity of the lumen of the stomach. And this decreased capacity of the lumen is mainly produced by lionized dysplastica or leather bottle type, or if there is some fungating or polypoid type of mass which is going towards the lumen, it will also lead to narrow lumen of the stomach. Bloating, okay? Bloating means it's a fullness, it's a sense of fullness. It's a sense of gas formation there. And distension is swelling of that area, okay? So many causes are there for the distension. One of the causes is ascites, which we have just talked about. Another is gastric outlet obstruction that can lead to massive distension of the stomach, okay? That can also lead to distension of that area. Obstruction leads to dysphagia, especially if the tumor is present at the cardiac end. Dysphagia can occur. What is dysphagia? What is dysphagia? Difficulty to swallow. Sir. Difficult, difficulty, difficulty to swallow. To swallow. Exactly. Follow. Difficulty to swallow. Very good. Difficulty to swallow is done as dysphagia. So quite easy to understand. If the tumor is at cardiac end of the stomach, it may compress the distal end of the esophagus. Another is features of gastric outlet obstruction. GOO, gastric outlet obstruction. If the tumor is at pyloric end, we already talked that okay, uh, in today's class. Another is epigastric fullness. Another feature may be bleeding, okay? Bleeding, that bleeding may lead to hematomesis or even melina. Yes, melina can also occur. It depends how much blood is collected there. Or if the bleeding is persistent and ongoing type of bleeding, and it is not uh, the major amount, you know, it can give rise to iron deficiency anemia. This is microcytic hypochromic anemia. There may be formation of a palpable mass, okay, especially in the epigastric area or by the involvement of the liver, and it may present with perforation as well, but that is a bit rare. Perforation is more common in peptic ulcer disease than in the carcinoma of the stomach. These all are features of the advanced disease. Now, Another type of clinical feature we can include here are the metastatic feature. Okay, now see there, so easy to understand. The peritoneum is affected. This is known as peritoneal seeding, or you can say peritoneal infiltration, which may lead to ascites. Okay, Krukenberg tumor, which can lead to bilateral enlargement of the ovary. The tumor cells go and deposit on the surface of the ovary. Okay, and there is a huge enlargement of the ovary on the both side, Krukenberg tumor. And there is even the formation of the pelvic mass. This is one of the, you know, example of metastatic feature. Another is a Troisier sign. Okay, and that is enlarged left supraclavicular lymph node. The name of that lymph node is Virko's lymph node. Okay. So remember this absolutely important MCQ question. So you can highlight this. Sister Joseph Nodule, it present in the umbilicus. Hepatomegaly and jaundice. Hepatomegaly and jaundice because of liver metastasis. Plural effusion, if the cancer has spread to the lung or cannonball appearance of the lung, we say cannonball, okay? Cannonball appearance is a rounded opacity present in the lung uh, when we take the chest X-ray. That, that means there is a secondary deposit in the lung as a result of other malignancy. These are the metastatic feature. So many other things you can include here, you know, bone involvement you can include here. Sometimes even brain involvement can occur. Now, 
the last type of the uh, clinical features are paraneoplastic syndrome. Paraneoplastic syndrome, okay, uh, is an interesting uh, sort of clinical feature in case of malignancy. Now, let me ask this question to some of the students. What is the meaning of paraneoplastic syndrome, anyone? Sir, when our body immune system attacks to the malignant cell, and sometimes it may attack to normal body tissue, and it's known as paraneoplastic syndrome. Okay, good, good. I, I, I will come back to you, okay? But good explanation, very good. Yes? Other? Any other? Same, sir. Same, okay. Now, now listen here. Uh, he has uh, explained a bit of pathophysiology there, but the meaning of uh, paraneoplastic syndrome is cancer cells or cancer or malignancy is present in one area, but the effect of that cancer or malignancy is present distant from that malignant site in other area. But that, you know, uh, affection is not because of metastasis of the malignant cell. Now, let me explain uh, by giving some example that you can clearly understand. There is carcinoma of the stomach, okay, or any other carcinoma, for example, carcinoma of the lung, for example, okay, carcinoma of the lung. The malignant cell from that carcinoma of the lung has not reached the adrenal gland, but rather that malignant cells are producing some hormone, okay, or hormone-like compound. And that hormone or hormone-like compound is producing the same effect as the adrenal gland hormone and causing Cushing syndrome. So this is known as paraneoplastic syndrome. And look at the connection. Adrenal gland is way, uh, very far away from the lung. And there is no direct type of metastasis but it is uh, this type of uh, clinical features are produced by certain secretion, certain substances which are released by the malignancy. Okay, now you have uh, clearly understood. Uh, so the type of uh, paraneoplastic syndrome which are seen in case of carcinoma of the stomach are acanthosis nigricans. This is hyperpigmentation of the axilla or the groin area. This is not the new term at all. Acanthosis nigricans is the feature of insulin resistance as well. We have talked about that before. But during that class, I clearly told you that is a, one of the tumor marker of visceral malignancy also. Never forget this. Look at this picture here. This is axillary area. And look at this velvety type of uh, you know, appearance. Black pigmented area with a little bit of raised from the surface. This is known as velvety appearance is typical of acanthosis nigricans. It is not only appearing here, but it is also appearing in insulin resistance case. In case of uh, gynecology and obstetrics, there is one condition which we have recently discussed. There also acanthosis nigricans can be found. What is that? Yes? Polycystic ovarian disease. Exactly. Polycystic ovarian syndrome or disease. Remember? That is a perfect scenario of uh, insulin resistance case. So acanthogen nigricans can be seen there also. Acanthogen nigricans can be seen other malignancy also. So not only here. Another important point here is Trousseau syndrome. This Trousseau syndrome is migratory thromboflevitis. Okay. This, uh, see that thromboflevitis is inflammation of the vein, especially the superficial vein. And this is migratory. Maybe, uh, you know, one day, one important, uh, so, so, you know, superficial vein is affected. And after two to three days, another vein will be involved with a similar type of mechanism. This is a Trousseau syndrome. It is also seen in pancreatic malignancy or pancreatic cancer. Now, with this uh, discussion, let's enter into the investigation part. Now, what investigation you like to do here? The most important one is endoscopy and then biopsy. This is the investigation of choice. If somebody asks you why this is the investigation of choice, you can give many different reasons here. Okay. First is with the help of endoscopy, the surgeon can directly visualize the malignant area, how it looks. And the diagnosis is quite easy. 
And even important reason than that, the surgeon can take biopsy from that area and confirm it in the lab. Third one, with the help of endoscopy, you know, you can do certain procedure there. If, if that area is bleeding, for example, you can stop that bleeder with the help of coagulation. So our three important pictures are shown here. This is called fungating type of growth. Look this, uh, it has grown towards the lumen, fungating. Okay. Another is a ulcerative. Okay. This is ulcerative ulcer. See this? This is the edge of the ulcer, which is overhanging edge. And this is a slough, a slough at the base of the ulcer. And this is a lineitis plastica. The lumen is very narrow now. It is uh, difficult to, you know, have a concept by only this picture. Uh, but this is a thickened abdominal, uh, you know, mucosa on the wall, and then a very narrow lumen. Another investigations after endoscopy is barium meal. Barium meal. What are the important points in barium meal? What are the suspicious findings? There may be a space occupying lesion or a space occupying mass present inside the stomach. There may be greater curvature ulcer. The ulcer is present with irregular border and there is disruption of the normal mucosal fold. Irregular border is important here. That area may be contracted, okay? And the stomach may be non-distensible. This is the feature of linitis plastica or leather bottle stomach. The fundic tumor, if they are present, they are difficult to evaluate because of poor filling, because the barium is always, you know, uh, collect in the distal area as a result of gravity. Okay, so the fundic areas are difficult to evaluate. And then there may be features of gastric outlet obstruction. No barium is going distally to the pyloric sphincter or uh, it is not flowing towards the duodenum. The clear cut obstruction can also be seen if it is present. These are the different features of barium meal. Now, look at this picture, all of you. Of focus here now. See this. This is the stomach outline. Okay, the outline of the stomach is here. But the clear cut outline is not seen, and the question is why? There is a huge mass here. See this. There is a polypoid growth along the lesser curvature of the stomach. So because of this polypoid growth, there is a filling defect. So the barium is not collected here, okay? Barium is not collected here. So barium is only flowing here and going distally. So I can clearly say there is something wrong here and there's a big mass present. This type of information is provided by barium meal. Another one, see there, look at this erode area, okay? See this, there is one filling defect here. Another one, and there's the third one. So several filling defects are seen within a non-distensible segment of the gastric body. This is called infiltrative type of gastric carcinoma. Infiltrative type. So it clearly provides us important clue. So this is one of the good investigation in this case. Now, to find out where metastasis has occurred, which investigation we want to include? These are known as metastatic investigation or metastatic workout. We can go for uh, abdominal or pelvic CT scan. Abdominal or pelvic CT scan, definitely. It is done all the time because there is lymph, lymph node metastasis. There is metastasis to the other visceral organs of the abdomen. Okay, There may be pelvic metastasis. In case of female, there may be Krukenbox tumor and all those things easily picked by CT scan. Endoscopic ultrasound can be done. This is one of the you know, uh, advances in ultrasound. It's the best way to stage the tumor. With the help of endoscopy, ultrasound probe is inserted there and then okay, uh, it is done. It has got a lot of sensitivity than the you know, conventional type of ultrasound. Chest X-ray, liver enzyme, and liver ultrasound are routinely done 
for the evidence of metastasis. Now, chest X-ray. If there is lung metastasis or if there is pleural effusion, chest X-ray can clearly show that. And that is known as cannonball appearance. So let me write that important term here for you. Cannonball appearance. This is an important radiological term. Cannonball appearance means lung metastasis or pulmonary metastasis. These are rounded type of opacity which are present in the lung and usually they are bilaterally affected. Liver enzymes are elevated uh, in case of uh, liver metastasis. Now, which liver enzymes are elevated here? Which liver enzymes? Yes. Which are those? AST. ALT, GGT, 1,5-nucleoside. Good. Good. Now, now let, let us uh, take the name of those liver enzymes. He's right. The name of the liver enzymes are AST, okay, ALT, ALP, okay, then GGT, and 5, okay, nucleotidase. Yes, these are the important one. Now, out of this, okay, out of these, some are more easily raised than the other. Now, we need to understand that. I'm just uh, utilizing this opportunity to explain further to you, you know. AST and ALP, sorry, AST and ALT, aspartate aminotransferase and alanine aminotransferase are mainly present inside the hepatocyte. They are present inside the liver cell. So if liver cells are damaged because of metastasis, AST and ALT will be higher. If lymph nodes are enlarged, and if those lymph nodes are pressing on the bile duct, then ALP, GGT, and 5-nucleotidase will be elevated because these are the enzymes, okay? Because these are the enzymes which are connected with biliary channels, okay, biliary channels. So that is the answer. So it, it, it can affect directly the liver or it can obstruct the biliary duct, we don't know. So according to the situation, you know, the different types of uh, liver enzymes may be higher, understand like that. Let's move on. Now, after you know uh, talking about all these different type of investigation, the final part is the management. Now let me uh, give you some concept of the management first, then we'll talk about this in detail. The most important type of treatment in case of carcinoma of the stomach is surgery. Surgery, surgery is the only curative treatment for early gastric carcinoma. But we need to diagnose this in time. Diagnosis is such an important one. Without diagnosis, how can you go for the treatment, isn't it? So diagnosis matters a lot. For advanced cases, palliative surgery can be done. Palliative, it's not a curative one. Palliative surgery means we want to improve the quality of life in that patient. We're suffering a lot because of you know, advanced type of gastric cancer. So improving the quality of life means decrease the pain. Okay? decrease the pain. If patient cannot swallow anything, probably decompress that mass, isn't it? Or debulk that mass so that patient can swallow, patient can enjoy eating some food before dying. So all these things are called palliative surgery. The second modality of the treatment is radiotherapy. The routine use of radiotherapy is controversial in case of carcinoma of the stomach. And radiotherapy has a role in the palliative treatment of painful bony metastasis. Now, patient is suffering pain because of the bony metastasis, because there is persistent pain. There may be even fracture because of the bony metastasis. So radiotherapy has a role to play in destruction of those metastatic area. It may help. Third is a chemotherapy. Gastric cancer may respond well to the combination of cytotoxic adsorbent chemotherapy and new adjuvant chemotherapy. Adjuvant okay, means in combination to other therapy. They are not the only therapy. We always combine them with something else like surgery. Combination of 
epirubicin, cis platinum, and 5 fluorouracil can be given. This is not an important you know, a part of the management. Nobody is uh, going to ask any question from this. We love to ask what are the different types of surgery and what are the different types of reconstructive surgery in case of carcinoma of the stomach. Now, let's talk about this curative surgery. It is applicable for early cases, definitely, because it can be curable, you know, the early gastric cancer. The goal of curative surgery is to resect all tumor with negative margin and adequate lymphadenectomy. So negative margin means I need to sacrifice some of the normal area also, okay? Some of the normal area, which is very near to the malignant site. So I need to sacrifice that area along with the removal of the lymph node. And this is known as lymphadenectomy. So two type of processes are available for a subtotal gastrectomy. And now this is a total gastrectomy followed by reconstruction surgery. So subtotal means a small part of the stomach is left behind. The surgeon decision matters there, you know. If the surgeon thinks I don't need to remove whole stomach, he can do that. It's not a subtotal gastrectomy. And if the surgeon thinks it is too risky to leave any part of the stomach behind, so let's remove all of that. It is known as total gastrectomy. Along with that, the lymph node resection or a lymphadenectomy is absolutely important procedure. Uh, we combine this together with gastrectomy. So uh, what type of lymph node resection they like to do? At least a D2 gastrectomy. This D2 means removal of the second tier of the lymph node is performed on all operable gastric cancer. Now, if you remember, I explained uh, this uh, regarding the lymphatic or lymph node metastasis. D1 is a first tier of the lymph node, which are connected with the lesser curvature or greater curvature of the stomach. D2 is a second tier of the lymph node, which are present in the origin of the blood vessels in that area, like celiac trunk area, left gastric blood vessel or left gastric artery, splenic artery, okay, or even hepatic artery. The lymph nodes which are present there are called D2 lymph node. So they are removed, that is the point. Some centers are practicing more radical surgery, okay, like D3 or even D4 resection. Now, what is the meaning of that different tier of the lymph node, okay? Let me highlight that once again. Okay, see here, D1 is a perigastric lymph node, which are directly attached along the lesser curvature and greater curvature of the stomach, perigastric lymph node. D2, lymph nodes near the hepatic, left gastric, celiac, and splenic artery, as well as those in the splenic hilum. These are D2, a second tier of the lymph node. D3 or the third tier include the lymph node along the hepatodudinal ligament. This is the free edge of the lesser omentum and at the root of the mesentery. Okay. And D4 lymph nodes are the lymph node present at the paraortic area and the paracolic area. Paraortic are the important one. Means on both sides of the abdominal aorta, the lymph nodes are present there. Now, what are the uh, you know types of gastrectomy? All of you, please focus now. The first one is called total gastrectomy. Another one is called partial gastrectomy, or you can call it subtotal gastrectomy. Total gastrectomy is mainly done in uh, carcinoma of stomach, where there is a proximal third gastric cancer. Proximal third means the cancer is present in the upper part of the stomach. In this condition. Stomach is removed in block. Okay. In block means the whole stomach is removed. Whole stomach. No part is left behind, including the tissues of the entire greater omentum and lesser omentum. So they are also removed. So this is a massive surgery. And then one important thing we have to do now that is gastrointestinal continuity is reconstituted by means of. Roux NY loop. 
this is known as reconstructive surgery okay to maintain the continuity ru and y loop it almost looks like uh, the letter y okay and is it a, it is the best type of reconstruction which can be done after gastric resection i'll i'll uh, talk about this in the next slide okay let me go through the partial gastrectomy first in patients with tumor distally placed in the stomach they go for partial gastrectomy distally placed means antral type of malignancy subtotal gastrectomy is very similar to a total gastrectomy except that the proximal stomach is preserved subtotal is another term for partial okay so what is the meaning in subtotal the proximal part of the stomach is preserved you don't need to remove it because the malignancy is towards the distal side after that reconstruction can be performed as billroth 2 or polya type of gastrectomy billroth 2 you already know i have taught this in the topic of peptic ulcer disease in billroth 2 remember uh, you do not uh, join the remaining part of the stomach to the duodenal loop okay you do not join to the duodenum the that uh, you know first part of the duodenum that stump is closed and then a, a part of the jejunal loop is anastomose with the remaining part of the stomach that is called billroth 2 uh, you know reconstructive surgery so let's see look at the picture and uh, make our concept clear now focus here this is very very important knowledge this is called ru and y loop now see there where is the stomach here we have completely removed it there is no stomach this is the lower uh, you know end of the esophagus this one okay this is the area of stomach but Uh, stomach is resected completely this is total gastrectomy done now we have to give the continuity to the gi tract okay so see this this is the duodenal stump okay duodenum first part of the duodenum is closed see this this is the duodenum and this duodenum till here is the duodenum right now a piece of the jejunum is cut and the proximal end of that jejunum see this this is closed again the side of that proximal part is sutured on the lower end of the esophagus and distally see there the side of the distal loop of the jejunum the side okay is again sutured to the you know end which is coming from the duodenum now this almost looks like a letter y see this if you if you see here this is one branch of the y this is another one okay that's why it is known as ru and y okay type of reconstruction now tell me what is the advantage of this type of reconstruction anybody what is the advantage sir there is no reflux of the bile sir yes, sir. sir we can sir avoid the grd sir the reflux basically there is exactly. reflux exactly there is no chance of reflux of the bile excellent now see this Uh, the bile is coming to the second part of the duodenum which is not shown here okay second part of the duodenum then the bile will come here and this is a long you know pathway for the reflux of the bile so it will not happen here and the bile will go distally so this is called ru and y type of reconstruction now this is billroth 2 it's very easy see this in billroth 2 okay see that there is a you know lesion here peptic ulcer disease or carcinoma of stomach now right now we are talking carcinoma of stomach so let's say this is the area of carcinoma of stomach so subtotal gastrectomy is done the proximal part of the stomach is still left behind now okay now what they do they do not connect the remaining part of the stomach to the duodenum rather they will connect it to the jejunum okay so this is the duodenal stump for example till here is the duodenum let's say okay so this is the jejunal loop so the food which whatever the patient eats will directly go to the jejunum and the bile is nicely coming here and it is again going from this route to the distal one 
but there is a still a bit of chance of reflux of the bile here okay because bile is coming like this uh, it is uh, reaching very near to the stump of the stomach so there is a chance that bile will reflux up this is another picture which is a even better one to explain the ruen y loop ruen y loop is also done for subtotal gastrectomy okay now this is a subtotal gastrectomy because the proximal part of the stomach is still there is it still there this is the proximal part of the stomach so this is the duodenal stump see there okay it is not connected to the duodenum rather it is connected to the loop of the jejunum from the side on type of anastomosis and the distal end is also connected like this excellent type of reconstructive surgery now let's move on what do you, what is a palliative surgery and what are the indications for palliative surgery now it is important that patient with incurable diseases are not subjected to radical surgery that cannot help them now this is a very very important point for the doctors and we have to convince this to the patient as well as patient's family now everybody wants the disease to be completely cured but all the time it is not possibility so we need to explain this if okay the disease is it stage 3 or stage 4 or you know very advanced type of disease and if we you know open the abdomen and we try to go for surgery we will do more harm to the patient than benefit and the patient you know uh, will suffer from that surgery and that's why the concept of palliative surgery has come here so first of all we should know what are the indication these are unequivocal evidence of incurability means if these features are there then we have to tell to the patient party that cure is not possible okay these are hematogenous metastasis cure is not possible now involvement of the distant peritoneum resulting in ascites n4 nodal disease and disease beyond the n4 node they are also known as tr4 or d4 node remember in case of carcinoma of the stomach the para aortic lymph nodes and para colic lymph nodes are called fourth tier lymph nodes or d4 if they are affected then probably it has gone too far already fixation to structure that cannot be removed extensive local invasion okay like retroperitoneal area are affected so these all are evidence of incurability and we have to go for palliative type of surgery Now, what are these uh, palliative surgery one is palliative gastrectomy okay palliative gastrectomy now this gastrectomy is not done for cure remember that it is just to, just done to make the quality of life better for the patient so it is applicable for obstruction or ongoing bleeding okay it need not be radical and it is sufficient to remove the tumor so whatever surgery is necessary the surgeon will do that only just to remove the mass so that the obstruction is no more there or if it is actively bleeding then bleeder should be stopped or it is removed followed by reconstruction of the gi tract so that patient can swallow patient can eat the continuity of the gi tract is maintained that's the point another is gastroenterostomy a connection of the stomach with simply yeah, you know intestine for inoperable cases we can go for that even without removing of the mass okay and uh, if the inoperable tumors are situated in the cardiac end cardiac end either palliative intubation stenting or another form of pre canalization can be used because it it uh, obstructs the lower end of the esophagus so patient even cannot swallow properly okay so stenting a recanalization can be used stenting means putting a tube there artificial tube at the center of the lesion now what is the prognosis this is important point how bad is this cancer or carcinoma of the stomach it depends on the stage of the tumor for early gastric carcinoma 
the five year survival rate after potentially curative resection is greater than 70%. So this is a good, good point, but only for the early gastric carcinoma. And remember, we have already talked about in early gastric carcinoma, the diagnosis is challenging one because the sign and symptom are almost similar to the gastritis or peptic ulcer disease. Now, for all cases referred, the overall five-year survival rate is approximately 37%. Means when they combine advanced gastric carcinoma and early gastric carcinoma, overall uh, survival rate is around 37%. It is still better than carcinoma of the lung or pancreatic cancer or gallbladder cancer, but overall this is less. Okay, so at the end, I like to uh, request you all to like the video as much as possible, share it among your friends and subscribe to the channel so that it will encourage me a lot for the future videos and recordings. Thank you so much.